So today we have the opportunity to uh, discuss a very important topic with uh, Virginia Hernandez from uh, Madrid, Spain. And she's uh, a member of the EIU guidelines of muscle invasive bladder cancer. Thank you so much, Virginia, for going through the topic of neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, in the field of muscle invasive bladder cancer. We are listening to you. Thank you. Radical cystectomy remains the gold standard treatment for muscle invasive bladder cancer. But more than 30% of patients treated with only surgery will relapse during follow-up. And the survival is especially poor in those cases diagnosed with M-positive or locally advanced disease. So there are several benefits of giving a new adjuvant treatment. It's delivered at the earliest time point when the burden of micrometastasis is supposed to be low. We will find a patient uh, in better condition that will tolerate better the treatment. And it also gives us the opportunity to assess the biology of the tumor and the uh, response to uh, the first treatment. And the oncological benefits of neoadjuvant chemotherapy are well known since a long time ago. In 2003, the first meta-analysis was published and after that, three more meta-analyses have confirmed or updated the results. And with more than 3,000 patients included in 15 RCTs, cisplatin-based, we can say with level of evidence 1A that a combination chemotherapy based on cisplatin prior to the surgery will increase survival in 5 to 8%. But this is not the only benefit of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. It also allows to downstage the primary tumor. And some patients even get a complete response. That means PT0, N0 in the radical cystectomy specimen. That happens in around 30, 40% of cases in RCTs and a bit less in routine practice. And that's something important because the stage of the disease after surgery is the main prognostic indicator of survival. So a complete response means lower risk of death, lower risk of recurrence, and those patients will get the best uh, oncological outcomes we uh, can achieve in this disease. Regarding the regimen, uh, the French GATUC trial is the, the first phase three RCTs that compared the most popular regimens used in daily practice that are GEMCs or dose dense and VAC. They found similar pathological complete response rates that those then end back got higher local control rate with man manageable toxicity, but more severe asthenia and gastrointestinal side effects. The primary endpoint that's progression-free survival is not yet mature. We now know that neoadjuvant chemotherapy does not seem to affect surgical morbidity. It has no effect on the percentage of performable cystectomies, that's around 90%, and it doesn't increase the grade three, four postoperative complications. And we don't want to delay the surgery, uh, but there are conflicting results for patients that receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Anyway, it seems reasonable not to uh, delay surgery more than 10 or 11 weeks after chemotherapy completion, because it might increase the risk of mortality. Uh, the, uh, despite of these results, the level of implementation in clinical practice has been traditionally low. We've seen a clear change in practice patterns in the last years with an increase in the US and also in Europe, but still around 20, 30% uh, in daily practice. And one of the main issues uh, with new adjunct chemotherapy is the lack of predictors of response. There's been a lot of research looking for clinical factors or biomarkers or molecular subtypes that help us to select patients. So my first question to my colleagues is, do we have in 2020 any tool that help us uh, to select patients and predict the response? In daily practice, uh, I'm sure there is always a discrepancy between uh, all the publication and the presentation uh, we have from uh, oncological conferences and the reality of the practice. So outside any clinical trial, Sharok, do you use any marker that could help you to find a patient who are suitable for the chemo? Um, first of all, uh, thank you. This is, this is an excellent question. 
um, and your question comes basically to the to one key issue is we know that not every patient has a benefit uh, uh, from a therapy that is also toxic. And the major benefit is obviously in those that had clinical T3 disease with 42 months survival benefit compared to the clinical T2 in the Grossman study SWOG trial, where there was a, only a 19 month survival benefit. It was not negligible, but uh, it's a question of risk benefit. If you look at it today, approximately 50% uh, of the patients that you um, select for a radical cystectomy will be clinical T2 based on imaging by manual exam and so on. So the question is, how can we identify those patients who are most likely to benefit? And that's what we do currently. Um, um, to identify those patients that are high risk, I think you need to improve what we call the, the definition of stage. We need to expand or refine the definition of stage, realizing that we will have some understaging. Uh, one is the anatomic extent of the disease, that is the exam under the... Uh, um, um, under anesthesia or imaging, which we like uh, the MRI a lot uh, more and more to get the local staging. But there are also host factors, as uh, you mentioned, genetics have not taken a role. Tumor biology certainly plays uh, a major role today. Uh, tumor has histology with lymphovascular invasion will play a good role in the variant histology. So taking this together uh, for, for us uh, at the Medical University of Vienna, we have defined a sort of a criteria. And for us, if somebody is clinical T2, has pure ureteral carcinoma, uh, and clinical T2 based on exam on anesthesia and MRI, has no lymphovascular invasion and no hydronephrosis, and I said pure ureteral carcinoma, he has over 80 to 90% chance of cure with radical cystectomy alone. And this patient will undergo radical cystectomy without a neoadjuvant chemotherapy. If he has any signs of T3 or above, any form of those variants that we do not like, lymphovascular invasion or hydronephrosis, uh, his cure rate with radical cystectomy alone will be around 40 to 50% best case scenario. So this patient will give the, um, get a neoadjuvant systemic therapy with cisplatin. Obviously, if it's cisplatin eligible. There's been a lot of other uh, factors that we have tested and others have tested. Uh, um, specifically the DDR genomic alterations and, and other uh, alterations that we have looked over time and others have looked over time um, that may be, play a role, ERCC2, the, the, the molecular subtypes, uh, ERCC2 and so on. At the end, I do not think that they are game changers currently, but in the future they will play a role. So following neoadjuvant chemotherapy, most patients proceed directly to radical cystectomy. And we know there is uh, some discrepancy between clinical and pathological stage. So the clinical utility of restaging evaluation after chemotherapy has been investigated. It seems gives more accurate prediction of uh, uh, the pathological mm -hmm. stage. If we restate the disease before, uh, after chemotherapy and prior to the surgery, we can find two clinical scenarios. First, a favorable clinical restaging following chemotherapy that shouldn't be used to justify deviation from a standard consolidative therapy. And second, uh, non-responders that uh, could be identified on a restaging evaluation midway. The CT uh, is considered the optimal form of a staging but uh, the correlation with the radical cystectomy specimen is not so good. Multiparametric MRI offers better resolution and may be useful to inform on response. And the utility of PET-CT has also been evaluated. It can distinguish uh, between uh, responders and non-responders, but for the pathological complete response identification is less accurate. So I, I, I would like to ask my colleagues, uh, how should uh, we evaluate the response? If we should still use CT or uh, if, are we ready to change to multiparametric MRI? So the standard of care now for patients T2, T4, N0, M0, when they are fit for cisplatin, is neoadjuvant chemotherapy plus radical cystectomy. That's a strong recommendation in our guidelines. I would like to ask my colleagues if they consider uh, in their daily practice any exception for this recommendation. 
Very briefly, uh, Virginia, the, the two next points you wanted to, to, to raise, is, yeah. uh, if I remember correctly, is the evaluation of That's the That's right, the, the evaluation of the response. If it's a still CT, the standard uh, of doing, of re-evaluating the disease, or if we should change to, or are we ready to change to MRI? One point, obviously, is when it comes to neoadjuvant chemotherapy is the, also the number of cycles, uh, because uh, when you look carefully at the literature and you read between the lines, you will see that from a country to another, uh, the number of cycles of chemotherapy is not the same, and the moment of the evaluation chosen sometimes by the oncologist and the medical oncologist is not the same. So I believe that in my clinical practice, uh, what we are using is, uh, I would say, on a daily perspective, uh, is the CT, which remains uh, so far the best, and it's one point that uh, we develop uh, as an argument to do the chemo before the surgery is because after the surgery, there is nothing to evaluate the response as soon as you have taken out the bladder. Um, maybe we can uh, have a word with Benjamin on this point and uh, also the, get uh, very rapidly the opinion of Sharok. Uh, I think for, for the evaluation of the patient in a neoadjuvant setting, uh, CT scans remains the, the, the standard and um, in a daily practice MRI is not that easy to obtain uh, especially when you have to 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 perform multiple MRI um, uh, during the during the during the treatments anyway I think that there are uh, two interesting studies uh, published by um, the Andrea Neki team uh, in the in the pure zero one um, trial where they try to use multi, uh, multi-parametric MRI and biparametric MRI in the follow-up of the patients, and they shown that it has a great improvement uh, and a great accuracy. So it could be a, a great opportunity later uh, in the near future to use this MRI as a, as a, and a good assessment using the VRAD score. Um, the other idea would be to use a PET CT scan and in the same way, uh, there are some, some, some studies from the Pure Zero One who try to assess the, the use of PET CT scan. I think it's not ready for prime time. For now, the, the only study didn't show any benefit to use PET CT scan before treatment or just after, except for N plus disease. So for my opinion, for now, we have to, to stick with CT scan. Okay, maybe la, la, the last question, uh, Virginia, will go to Sharok for the... For uh, do, can I, uh, do you think yeah, I yeah. should uh, give yeah, a... Yeah. yeah, so so I think I think the question, Virginia, I think the, the question you're asking is a very important one, and it's actually two questions in one. One is to rule out metastatic disease. Number two is to uh, stage the tumor locally. So what am I saying here? Uh, ruling out metastatic disease, certainly CT scan or uh, in the future, hopefully PET-CT will uh, play a major role. Now, um, and that is if you're going to proceed with a radical cystectomy or non-responders, you're assessing if a patient failed to respond and progress. That is very rarely the case. So I think we, we are we're looking here for very rare cases. But um, the second part is the local disease, right? And here comes the most important part of the most future, um, uh, futuristic question is, in which patient can we avoid a radical cystectomy? We currently know that with CT scan and cystoscopy, according to a multitude of studies, um, even if both seem negative, 30% of patients will have still disease in the, in the bladder. Um, so we're not accurate enough. We all, you know, we're misstaging approximately uh, uh, 30% of the patients, so the negative predictive value is not good enough. And for the local staging, multiparametric MRI has a much higher negative predictive value. This has been shown according to a lot of primary studies, um, and not in after the neoadjuvant setting. Uh, as Benjamin had said, after uh, a checkpoint inhibition with pembrolizumab, but uh, yet I think there will be the major role. So in the future, if you want to avoid a radical cystectomy, I think multiparametric MRI for the local staging will play a major role to identify intravesical wall tumors, which are not seen by cystoscopy and will not be seen by, uh, by CT scan because it doesn't have the soft tissue resolution. Uh the only exception in the guidelines now is uh, variant histologies, especially pure squamous cell carcinoma and pure adenocarcinoma. And there is some debate for T2 patients. 
because um, in contemporary series of radical cystectomy alone, the survival of uh, T2 patients is really good, comparable for uh, uh, with uh, those uh, in RCTs with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And retrospective studies suggest that neoadjuvant chemotherapy might be an overtreatment for this group of patients. And finally, we have a group of patients that are non-eligible for cisplatin. That's a significant number of patients, up to 50% in some series. Uh, most uh, of them is because of their renal function. That's a variable that's highly age dependent. But we should all also pay attention to the performance status. If there is a high grade audiometric loss, peripheral neuropathy or a severe cardiac dysfunction. For patients that are non-eligible for cisplatin, carboplatin containing chemotherapy is not equivalent to cisplatin combinations, so it should not be considered interchangeable. So my last question to my colleagues is, what's the standard treatment for cisplatin and fit patients? Can we use a split dose cisplatin? or maybe no neoadjuvant treatment, or are we ready to recommend immunotherapy? So, Sharok, do you want to take the, the question? Well, this is, this is uh, a, a very important question, and this, this is going to allude to the talk I will give uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, certainly, at this moment, we have to abide by the guidelines. So if somebody is not cisplatin eligible, if you can make him cisplatin eligible, you're in the borderline area where you can split dose it, I would certainly try to do that. Uh, um, uh, in those patients that I, as I mentioned before, I would consider high risk. That means T3, some variant histology, hydronephrosis, or LVI. In the other patients that I would consider low risk, that is T2, no LVI, no variant histology, and no hydronephrosis, I would certainly move on to radical cystectomy. So those that I think that are very highly likely to have macrometastatic disease in the borderline GFR area, we will try to split those, um, um, uh, hydrate, and if there's any obstruction that you can see from the hydronephrosis or so on, uh, deobstruct with a percutaneous nephrostomy or a stent, uh, tumor stent if available. But I do not think this, that this is standard, and the immunotherapy is certainly not yet shown to result in survival benefit. So I think it's too early to offer that at this stage, and it's also not part of our guidelines of the EAU. Thank you very much. I think it's time to close this first part of the module of ESOU online. So thank you very much, Virginia, uh, for uh, this brilliant lecture, and uh, we'll move on to the second part rapidly. Thank you.